Blog Talk Radio. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Brain Builders Podcast. I am your host, Dr. John DeWitt, and today we're going to talk about how psychology, being social, and spirituality can actually help your brain. So the psychology of it all. In order to get your eating habits under control, it is critical to have the right attitude about it. And this is, uh, by the way, from Dr. Amon's book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Uh, Getting healthy is about abundance, not deprivation. This is a critical mind shift to make. Being unhealthy or overweight is a thinking disorder as much as it is an eating disorder. While Dr. Amon was consulting for a large organization, the wife of the CEO told me that when we first introduced the Brain Healthy program into their organization, she told her husband she would rather get cancer than give up sweets. That was when she realized that she had a serious problem with sugar. Eating in a brain-healthy way is one of the strongest forms of self-love. self-love. <clears throat> if you truly love and care for yourself, you need to be diligent about only putting healthy fuel inside your body. But it takes the right thoughts and attitudes to make it happen. If you want to unleash your full brain power, you have to be a warrior for the health of your brain and gain the upper hand against the constant bombardment of bad messages that try to make you shove bad food down your throat. How you think dramatically affects how you feel and every decision you make. And the lies you tell yourself are one of the biggest factors that drive illness. Here are some of the most common little lies that we hear about food. I don't want to deprive myself. Doesn't eating bad food deprive you of your health, your most precious precious resource? What is worth more, energy, a trim waistline, and good health, or the mountain of fries, sodas, cakes, and cookies that you have consumed over the last decade? And I, and I have to admit, I have consumed quite a few cakes and cookies. Not a big soda guy, but cakes and cookies, yeah. <coughs> Another little lie. I can't eat healthy because I travel. I hear that a lot, actually. Uh, Dr. Amon is always amused by this one because he travels a lot, too. It just takes a little forethought and planning. Or my whole family is overweight. It's in my genes. This is one of the biggest lies. Genes account for only about 20 to 30% of your health. The vast majority of health problems are driven by the bad decisions you make. Uh, Dr. Amon's genes say that he's likely to be fat, but he no longer makes the decisions that make this likely to happen. I can't afford to be healthy or to get healthy. Being sick is always more expensive than getting healthy. I can't find the time to work out. With a sharper mind, you will actually save time if you work out. It's Easter, Memorial Day, the 4th of July, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. There's always an excuse to hurt yourself. You have to find the excuse not to. So what are the lies you're you're telling yourself about food? Write them down and talk back to them. Once you identify them, write them down and acknowledge them, then you can formulate a plan whenever it pops up and it won't just be a habit. So what about getting social? Preparing meals and feeding our families is an important social activity. Being Lebanese, Dr. Avon knows about this firsthand. We are known for delicious Mediterranean food. It can be incredibly healthy. Hummus, tabbouleh, and grilled fish or lamb or or incredibly unhealthy butter cookies and baklava. had all those, and they are quite tasty. Uh, Throughout my life, this is Dr. Amon talking. It has been common for his mother, his wife, his aunts, his sisters, his daughters, and his nieces to be in the kitchen together cooking great meals. When the matriarch or patriarch leads the brain health charge, she or he has a huge influence on those who follow. The earlier you start, the better. As you've learned by now, social ties are so strong that they can have an immense effect on our health and habits. Researchers have found that the health of our family and friends is one of the strongest predictors of longevity. In 1921, Stanford psychologist Lewis Terman evaluated 1,548 10-year-old children. He and subsequent researchers then followed this group over the next 90 years, looking for the traits that were associated with success, health, and longevity. One of the main findings of the research was that social relationships had a dramatic impact on health. If your friends and family weren't healthy, you were much more likely to be unhealthy too. For people who want to improve their health, associating with other healthy people is usually the strongest and most direct path to change. This does not mean you have to give up all your friends and family who are struggling with their health share this program with them, and offer to do it together. 
Right now, Dr. Amy wants you to think of the people you love most in this world. Who do you call when something good happens and when something bad happens? He calls his wife, his parents, and his children. For each of these people, ask yourself, am I their friend or their accomplice? A friend is someone who helps their loved ones be successful, while an accomplice is someone who helps them maintain bad habits. Oh, come on. It'll be fine. It's just one time. I cook for you all weekend. Have more. Don't be a party pooper. It's the weekend. You're overworked, and you've earned it. Are you helping those who you love prevent devastating illnesses like Alzheimer's and depression, or are you unknowingly encouraging them, encouraging them to be sick? You can lead the change in your family. What about spirituality? Spiritual soul food. Your sense of spirituality underlies everything you do. As we have discussed, it is the fuel that provides your life with a deep sense of meaning, passion, and purpose. It is your connection to God. Generations past and future and even the future of our planet. Ask yourself, what is the underlying meaning and purpose for the food I eat and feed my family? Is it just for basic nutrition, for pleasure, fellowship? Is it to sustain my life so I can accomplish what I'm here on earth for? If your life has meaning and purpose, it is best served by a highly nutritious diet that that nourishes your brain, body, and soul. When Dr. Amy was first asked to be a consultant for the Daniel Plan at Saddleback Church, which I talked about earlier, Pastor Rick Warren talked to me about the biblical directive to honor our bodies. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. The way many people eat is definitely not honoring their bodies. Dr. Amon likes to use the acronym SOUL to understand how to eat in a spiritual way. It stands for sustainable. We can continue to grow the food indefinitely without hurting our planet. Organic, raised in a clean environment without toxins. Unadulterated, pure whole foods without artificial food dyes, sweeteners, or additives. Locally grown gives you a better chance of knowing the food is fresh and supports your local community. Consider how how the food you eat was raised. As I have mentioned, as Dr. Amon has mentioned, how are the animals treated? Is it humane? Would it make you sick if you knew? This is a question that has concerned me for a long time. Animals like humans release different chemicals in their bodies when they feel relaxed or stressed, happy or depressed, approachable or angry. If they are raised and then killed in a confined toxic environment where they feel stressed, angry, and depressed, then ultimately we are consuming the chemicals the animals release when they were stressed, angry, and depressed. How your food was treated matters to the health of your body for many reasons. If you think of eating as a spiritual discipline, it will help you not only give thanks for the food you have, but also take a much more thoughtful approach to raising, harvesting, and consuming it. Therapy for your kitchen. Just like therapists will explore the cabinets of your mind and help to clean them of the toxic or unhelpful memories, I want you to take an hour and clean your kitchen of unhealthy or toxic food. Refer to the nine rules of brain-healthy eating that we talked about previously. If the food doesn't serve your health, get rid of it. Don't donate to the poor. It will make them sick as well. So when and how to seek professional care. So now we're going to talk about these frequently asked questions. When is it time to see a professional about these problems? What should I do when a loved one is in denial about needing help? How can I find a competent professional? When should I think about getting a functional imaging study such as a SPECT? This is relatively easy to determine. I recommend that people seek professional help when their attitudes, behaviors, feelings, or thoughts interfere with their ability to be successful in the world, whether in their relationships, in their work, or within themselves, and when when self-help techniques have not helped them fully understand or alleviate the problem. Let's look at all three situations. Relationships. Underlying brain problems can truly sabotage relationships. If you or someone you know has issues that interfere with the quality of relationships, get help. Often it is necessary to address brain health concerns before working on communication and intimacy issues. I often use a computer analogy. You need to first fix computer hardware before it can effectively run sophisticated software. Let's take another look at how each brain system can interfere with relationships. The limbic system. Limbic system issues can be associated with depression and cause people to feel distant, irritable, unfocused, tired, negative, and uninterested in sex. Unless the partners understand this disorder, this often causes severe relational problems. People who suffer from depression have a divorce rate six times higher than those who are not depressed. Basal ganglia issues. 
These can be associated with anxiety and cause sufferers to feel tense, uptight, physically ill, and conflict avoidant. Partners often misinterpret the anxiety of physical symptoms as complaining or whining and do not take seriously the level of suffering. Anterior cingulate issues. These can lead to obsessive or over-focused tendencies and, as we have seen, cause rigid thinking styles. Oppositional or argumentative behavior, holding on to grudges, and chronic stress in relationships. Seeking help is essential to establishing a new ability to relate effectively. Prefrontal cortex. Problems here, such as ADD, often sabotage relationships because of the impulsive, restless, and distractible behavior involved. Without help, there is a high degree of relational and family turmoil. Temporal lobe. Problems here may be associated with frequent attacks of rage, angry outbursts, mood swings, hearing things in- incorrectly, and low frustration tolerance. Dr. Amen has seen these problems ruin otherwise good, re- good relationships. Workplace. The workplace is also affected by underlying and often unrecognized brain system problems. If you or someone you know suffers with these problems and they interfere with work, it is often essential to get professional help. Addressing these problems can literally change the whole atmosphere at work. Limbic system issues can cause depression, which can be associated with people being negative, unfocused, tired, and unmotivated, and taking things too personally or the wrong way. Such employees may negatively affect others' morale and unknowingly skew everyone's perception at work so they see positive things in a bad light. Depressed people have more sick days than people without depression. Basal ganglia issues can be associated with feelings of being anxious, tense, physically sick, and conflict avoidant. Their level of anxiety often causes them to be dependent and require too much supervision. Their anxiety tends to be contagious, and those around them may also begin predicting negative outcomes to situations. They can negatively affect a work group and tend to be fearful rather than hopeful. Interior cingulate issues can lead to obsessive or over-focused tendencies causing rigid thinking styles. Employers or employees tend to be more irritable, oppositional, or argumentative. They often hold grudges and can be unforgiving, causing long-term work- workplace problems. Prefrontal cortex problems, such as ADD, cause many problems at work, including chronic lateness, lateness inefficiency, missing deadlines, impulsive decision-making, and conflict-seeking behavior. Temporal lobe problems often affect work. Workplace violence may be associated with temporal lobe disorders. More commonly, temporal lobe problems are manifested at work by mood swings or unpredictable behavior, low frustration tolerance, misperceptions, auditory processing problems, and memory problems. The anger, misperceptions, and mild paranoia can wreak havoc in a work group. So that is where we're going to stop today. I hope you found that information useful. Stay tuned next time when we will cover uh your internal life what you're thinking gaining access to your own good brain wanting to be normal and what to do when a loved one is in denial about needing help and as always we have a link to our brain builders master class if you want to uh that's in the description of the podcast if you'd like to click on there you can join the wait list and be notified via email as soon as our next registration opens we are almost finished with that group. We're, we've been having such great, great feedback, and I, um, I'm just really happy to to be a part of it, of that and and seeing. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking some of the stories that, that I've heard, but we we surround each other with with support and encouragement, and it really is a, a great environment. And I um, urge you to partake in that, and that will be taking place um, probably in late November early December. So that is the Brain Builders Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeWitt, and I hope to see you next time.